Inhaling asbestos increases the chance of lung cancer more for smokers than non-smokers. The side effects of medication can depend on your gender. Your car will decrease in value with age unless it is a classic car. These are all examples of interactions. Identifying and incorporating these can drastically improve the accuracy and change the interpretation of your models. The question is, how do we find them? Hi, I'm Connor and welcome to ADO. Today, we'll explore one metric for analyzing interactions, Friedman's H statistic. This is also known as the H stat or H index. Specifically, I will explain the mathematics and intuition behind this metric and discuss its limitations. We will see that there are two versions of this statistic, one for the interaction between two features and one for the interaction between a feature and all other features. Make sure to stick around for next week's video where we will apply the metric using Python. Or if you want that content now, you can find it in my explainable AI course. If you sign up for the newsletter in the description, you can get free access to that course. Before we get to that, let's formally define an interaction. This will help you understand what we are trying to analyze. We take this definition directly from the paper that introduces the H stat. A function, f of x, is said to exhibit an interaction between two of its variables, xj and xk, if the difference in the value of f of x as a result of changing the value of xj depends on the value of xk. For numeric variables, this can be expressed with the formula you see here. The partial derivative can be interpreted as the rate of change of the rate of change of the function with respect to j with respect to k. So if the expected value is zero, then the rate at which the function changes with respect to feature j does not change when feature k changes and vice versa. With machine learning, f is our model, or in other words, the prediction function. A model will learn interactions from relationships within a data set. Yet, when we say two features interact, we mean they interact within a model. Okay, if you couldn't tell, this video is fairly maths heavy. To make it easier to understand, let's build some intuition around how the HDAT seeks to quantify interactions in a model. To do this, we'll use some of the plots we saw in a previous video, PDPs and ice plots. If you're not familiar with those plots, I recommend watching that video. To summarize, we build a model to predict the price of a second-hand car using features like age of the car and its type. We then visualize some of the relationships using PDPs and ice plots. I also explain the formula for PDPs. We will see that the H stat builds on the formula of a joint PDP. First, we have the PDP for car age. This gives the average predicted price of a second-hand car as the car's age increases. We can see that, in general, price decreases with age. Here, we have the PDP for car type. This feature had two classes, either classic or normal. Classic cars tend to have a higher price on average. Both of the relationships for car age and car type are intuitive, but what if we want to understand the joint PDP of the two features? If there's no interaction, the joint PDP will be additive. For a given instance, we could simply add its value from the car age PDP to the value from the car type PDP, provided we then center the joint PDP. This property comes from the definition of an interaction. If there's no interaction, then the changes in the prediction with respect to car age will not depend on the value of car type and vice versa. However, remember this ice plot. It clearly shows that there is an interaction between the two features. We can see that for classic cars, the effect of car age on the predicted price will be different than for normal cars. So if we simply added the values from the car age PDP to the PDP value for classic cars, we would underestimate the effect of age for these cars. In other words, the PDPs are not additive. This is the key to understanding the H stat. 
we compare the observed joint PDP to the joint PDP under the assumption that there's no interaction between the two features. We can also extend this concept to analyze interactions between a feature and all other features in the model. Let's move on to a more formal explanation for this. We start with the formula for the partial dependence function. Remember, S is a set of features and C is the set of features excluding those in S. To find the PD function of S, we integrate our model function with respect to the probability of observing the values in set C. Suppose S consists of two features, J and K. This equation gives the joint PD function of these features. We want to understand if these features interact. The HSTAT does this by comparing this PD to the same PD under the assumption that there is no interaction. What does this PD look like? Well, if we assume that J and K do not interact, we can reformulate their joint PD as the sum of two individual PDs, one with just xj and another with just xk. Now, we won't get into the proof for this, aka I'm too lazy to understand it. We have already discussed the intuition, but let's try to gain even more intuition for why it's correct. It follows from this mathematical theorem. If there's no interaction between these variables, a function f of x can be expressed as this sum of two functions, one that is independent of xj and the other that is independent of xk. Yeah, capital X minus j and capital X minus k respectively represents all variables except xj and xk. It is easy to show that this theorem is valid for linear regression. Take the regression function f of x, where x consists of two features, j and k. To get two functions, we can break up the linear equation. But if xj and xk do interact, we would have to include an interaction term. Now, I challenge you to find two functions, f and j. The theorem does not only apply to prediction functions. It is true for any function of our features, such as a PD. If you are concerned about the pesky constants, remember that we can center our PDs around any value to get rid of them. Okay. So that explains the equation for the PD under the assumption that there is no interaction. Let's see how we can compare it to the observed joint PD. This equation gives the H dot for the interaction between two features, J and K. Let's break this down. In the numerator, we have the value of the observed PD less the PD under the assumption there is no interaction. We square this, so both positive and negative differences contribute to the H stat. In the denominator, we normalize the difference by dividing by the square of the observed PD. We then sum these values over n instances. By normalizing, the H stat will tend to be between zero and one. This gives the value a useful interpretation. To understand it, Let's consider the extremes. If there is no interaction, then the joint PD will be the same as the additive PD. The numerator will be zero, and so the H stat will be zero. If the two features only affect the prediction through an interaction, that is no main effects, both individual PDs will be constant. The numerator will be the same as the denominator, and the H stat will have a value of one. In other words, we can interpret the H stat as the percentage of variance in the joint PD that comes from the interaction between the two features, or more simply, the percentage of the effect on a prediction that comes from the interaction between the features. However, there are cases where the H stat will have a value larger than one. This can happen due to statistical variation, or if the main effects cancel each other out, and the variance of the interaction effect is larger than the variance of the joint PD. We can extend this idea to understanding if a feature interacts with any other feature in the model. We call this the overall H stat. To start, we can extend the mathematical theorem we introduced earlier. That is, if a given variable xj 
interacts with none of the other variables in a function f of x, then the function could be expressed as the sum of two functions. One is a function of xj and the other of all the variables excluding xj. So if xj does not interact with any other features in the model, we can write the prediction function as the sum of two PDs. Finally, to calculate the overall HDAT, we use this equation. This compares the prediction function to the prediction function under the assumption that xj does not interact with any other features. If this assumption is true, the HDAT will have a value of zero. If xj only affects the predictions through interactions, then we'll have a value of one. Combined, the HDAT and ice plots are an effective tool for analyzing interactions in your model. We can first use the overall HDAT to find features with important interactions, and then the individual HDAT to find the features they interact with. Once we have a list, ice plots can visualize them to understand their nature. Yet, like ice plots, the HDAT still has its limitations. The first is that the HDAT is computationally expensive. It is often impractical to calculate it for the entire dataset or even a fairly large sample. As a result, we may have to take a small sample of instances from our dataset. This can lead to issues around the variability of the HDAT. As mentioned, the HDAT tells us the proportion of variance in the joint PD explained by the interaction between two features. This does not tell us how much the interaction has actually affected the prediction. Consider the case where two features only affect the prediction through an interaction, but those effects are close to zero. This means the numerator will be small. However, the denominator will also be close to zero. By dividing by the small value, we can end up with a large HDAT. Additionally, minor changes due to statistical variation and sampling can result in large swings in the HDAT. Ultimately, we can be misled to believe that an interaction is significant. To avoid this, a non-normalized version of the HDAT has been proposed. This is simply the square root of the numerator from the original equation. We do, however, lose the useful interpretation from the original equation. So as another alternative, we can stick with the original equation and use a measure of feature importance, such as permutation feature importance, or even mean shaft. This will allow us to understand which features make significant contributions to the prediction. Another way that the HDAT can mislead us is by identifying interactions when features are actually highly correlated. We call these spurious interactions. To understand why, we can consider how tree-based methods model nonlinear relationships. The reasons are similar for other nonlinear models. Let's consider a model used to predict someone's credit score. Suppose income has a nonlinear relationship with credit score. More specifically, income in the last 12 months. To model this with a single tree, we would have to include multiple splits of the income feature. Now, suppose we also have another income feature in our feature set. Income six is the income in the last six months. The two features would likely be highly correlated and have a similar relationship with the target variable. This means we could capture the same nonlinear relationship using different income features at different levels of the tree. Within an ensemble model, this can happen multiple times in different trees. The problem is, this is exactly how a tree method captures an interaction between two features. By consistently having the same two features in a tree, we can capture the effect of one of the features at different values of the other feature. Ultimately, using a metric like the HDAT, it will look like there is an interaction between income and income six, when in fact the features are highly correlated. So again, we face the nemesis of explainable AI, multicollinearity. When applying the metric in the next video, we will see how this can influence results. It emphasizes the need for good feature selection, or at least to be aware of highly correlated features. As an alternative, you may find this video on ALEs useful. It is a model agnostic method that is robust to multicollinearity. Or see this video, which goes into more detail on how 
permutation methods like the HDAT are impacted by multicollinearity. And remember, you can find loads more in my XAI course.